All right, so let me start by talking about number three on the quiz. Understanding this stuff is the main thing that I'll be testing tomorrow. No other thing is going to be tested more than understanding the ideas in number three. Um, so it's important. So let me go through this. Um, you have a fixed joint. And all of these connections are pin joints. And you have a distributed load here that didn't wasn't really important to this problem. There's a pin here, here, and there. Um, and all I asked you to do on the quiz was the free body diagrams. Um, OK, so I'm going to do this with two different numbering systems. Um, Okay, so I'm going to do this one first, and then this one. Uh, so let's start out with, for the first one, I'm going to do one, two, three, four, five. And for the second one, I guess I'll count the other way. Uh, one, two, three, four, Five. And we're going to get different free body diagrams uh, based on at the different joints, which is the lowest numbered member at that joint. Um, the interesting thing is that even though the free body diagrams look totally different, if you solve it, you'll get different numbers for all your forces. But then if you take those forces and put them back into, like, figure out what the total external loads are at every point on every body, they match. So. What you number, what is arbitrary in solving these problems, but you do need to understand, you know, um, you need to follow the approach the right way. Okay, so for part A, um, let's call, let me name all these joints, and I guess I'll keep the numberings the same. Let's, so let's call it A, B, C, D. And that's what I'll do for this one, too. Um, and let's look at side views of all the joints first. So A. Side view. Uh, let's see. A is a connection between one and two and nothing else. So there's body one, there's body two, there's a pin connecting them. And we're lumping this pin in with the lowest numbered member, so we'll assume that it's. We'll treat it like it's part of member one, like that. Um, joint B, we have member two, member three. And member four, and actually I sort of 
it would make more sense if I drew the, the other upside down. So um, there's member two, member three, and member four, and there's a pin connecting all of those. And again, we assume that the pin, we treat the pin like it's part of the lowest numbered member at that joint. So it looks like this. And the point of doing all this is you can see what's touching what. Like, for example, at joint B, you can see three and four aren't touching each other. Hi. Um, but two is touching both of them because that pin is part of two. Joint C, uh, we have one, three, and five. The lowest numbered member is one, so we're going to lump the pin in, consider the pin to be part of member one. And so three and five aren't touching each other. Three is touching one and five is touching one. Um, and then D, we just have four and five. And the ones where there's only two bodies touching, uh, nothing too complicated is going on. It's, it's the one where there's more than two touching that things get a little trickier. Okay, so we just have five and four. And the lowest numbered member there is four. So that's the one that we're lumping the pin in with. OK, so now let's go. So now I have all those side views. And like I've said before, if, if you ever get, like even when this makes sense to you, sometimes you'll get yourself confused as you're trying to work through it. And if you get confused, this is a good way to get yourself unconfused. Draw, draw the joints that are connected to that body, see what's touching what. Um, okay, so first I'll do member one. Uh, member one has a fixed joint at the right end. So there's a full force vector and a couple. And then at joint A, it's touching body two. There's only two joints, uh, two members connected at that joint. So nothing complicated is happening here. You just have a force on one of them by the other one. And if you look at what that joint looks like, you can see that that's you know, look at the side view and you can see that that's what's going on. What's touching member one, member two is. Okay. But now the more complicated one comes at this joint C because there we have three members in contact. Um, okay, so look at the side view of joint C and what members are touching, are touching member one. Three is touching the pin and five is touching the pin. So both of those forces need to be there. So there's a force on one by three and a force on one by five. Okay, so now we'll go to two. Free body diagram of two. The endpoints are the joints A and B. At A, um, 
what's touching member 2, 1 is. So we have F2, 1 down here, or you can write it as negative F1, 2. And then up at the other joint, up at B, uh, there are three members connected at the joint B. Um, so what's touching member two? Well, member two is the lowest numbered member at that joint, so all of them are in contact with a pin. So there's going to be both of those two forces acting on member two. There's going to be force on two by three and force on two by four. Okay. So, so far, um, nothing that tricky has happened because I started out with the lower numbered members. And so every force happening at those joints appears in those free body diagrams. But now, as we get to the members that aren't going to be the lowest numbered member at every joint, things get a little more subtle. Okay? So, free body diagram of three. That's this one. There are two joints we have to worry about, B and C. Um, so at B, what's in contact with member three? So look at this side view. Um, three is touching two because it's touching the pin, but it's not touching four. So all there is there is a force on three by two, or negative F2, three. Okay, this is, this is the thing that's tricky about this that you have to get straight. Um, the whole point of this side view is that you can visualize how three and four are not in contact even though they're meeting at the same joint. Okay, uh, and then at C, there's one and five. Three is not the lowest numbered member at that joint. So the only thing touching three is the pin, which is member one. So here you have the force on three by one or negative F13. Free body diagram of four. The joints there are B and D. Um, four is not the lowest numbered member at B. It is at D, but there's only two, two members there, so nothing complicated is going to happen there. Um, but at B, if you look at the side view, the only thing that four is in contact with is two. So we have negative F2, four. Over here we have positive F4, 5, and then the distributed load, however you want to treat that. And then the last one is the other diagonal. Well, this is the highest numbered member in the whole thing which means that it's only going to be touching the pin at any joint. No matter, you know, in any structure, the highest numbered member is only touching the pin. Um, so uh, at C, it's touching 1. And at D, it's touching 4. So here we have the force on 5 by 1, or negative F1, 5. And here we have the force on 5 by 4, or negative F4, 5. Yep? Um, looking at what you did, I pretty much did the same thing. But um, like, uh, right, what I think I did wrong was, for example, my body 2, 
I said four seven five by two instead of you know maybe saying four seven two by five. Like, that doesn't matter, right? Like, well, it does matter. I I didn't. Let's let's talk about that specific okay. case because yeah, they do mean two different things. You know, um, f five two means negative f two five. So so if you treat them like they're the same, you're going to get a lot of things backwards. Um, but let me look at that. Uh, the main thing I was looking for is just this. Um, if you're not doing this thing where um, you're lumping the pin in with one of the members and only one of the members, then you're double counting forces and your answers are going to be all wrong. Yes, you could. Yep. Yeah, I don't think anyone did that, but um, if you would have done that, I would have been like, you sneaky bastard. <laughs> I would have like grudgingly given you those points. Okay, so am I really going to do it this other way? Yes. <laughs> Okay, so this time, uh, one is the one is the far diagonal, um, so it's touching four at the top, and at the bottom it's touching 3 and 5. So we have F14 here, and here we have F13 and F15. And then two is the top piece. That's touching one over here. So this is F21 or negative F12. You have the distributed load. And then on the right side, it's touching three and four. And it's the lowest numbered member of that joint, you know. So so it has to be touching both of those. So here we have F23 and F24. And then 3 is the other diagonal. At C, that joint connects 1, 3, and 5, but 1 is the lowest numbered member, so uh, 1 has the pin attached. So 3 doesn't see 5 at all. 3 only touches 1. So there's a force on 3 by 1 at C, and all it sees is 2 at joint B because 2 is the lowest numbered member there. So... Um, we have F31 down here, or negative F13. And we have F32 here, negative F23. Then member four. That's the vertical member. At B, the pin is 2, so that's the only thing it touches. So we have F4, 2 at the top, and then it's only connected to uh, 5 at the bottom. So 
we have F42 or negative F24 at the top, and we have F45 at the bottom. And then the last one is the piece connected to the wall. At the fixed joint, we still have a force vector and a moment. And then at joint A, it's touching 4. And at joint C, it's touching the pin, which is member 1. So here we have F54, or negative F45. And here we have F51, or negative F15. So if you look at those free body diagrams, they're totally different. Uh, it looks like there shouldn't be any connection between the two. But if you solve it and then combine any force vectors that are happening at the same point, you see that uh, the answers are all the same. Any questions about that? Okay. So I really can't imagine writing this test in a way that doesn't have a problem almost exactly like this. So. Um, yeah, exactly. Yes? Uh, I think when I asked you this issue of people are used to combine the statement that uh, tomorrow is pretty much just so structured on the Well, it's. It's up to structures, so there's going to be old stuff. But yes, there will be no internal loads. That's right. Yep. Yeah, no internal loads. Uh, and then my second comment, I didn't take off any points for this, but uh, there was a stunning laziness about vector symbols. Shocking. If you, yeah, if you have a variable that's a vector, you put a vector symbol on it so that people know what kind of variable it is. It sounds so easy. Who had the one that I just wrote it all over? Oh, it's, he's, not, he's so lazy, he's not even here. I have a question. Yes. You wrote that no vector symbol on N. Oh, yeah. That's right. OK. The, um, so when you draw your couples like this, that's kind of the equivalent of showing, it is the, the moment equivalent of showing a force direction. So in that case, you just associate that with a scalar the same as you would with, a, with an arrow. Any other questions? About the final, yeah. that's next Friday, right? Yes. It's only the kind of problems we've been doing. Okay, and then do we have to worry about like a final quiz at all for conceptual questions, or do we just? Oh, um, like a cumulative? Yeah. No, but okay. next time I teach this class, there is going to be so. So don't fail this class. <laughs> I was going to say make it through. <laughs> no, that's what. Yeah, I've been thinking about that. That would be really good, but I'm not doing it this that way. Okay. <laughs> Um, any other questions? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So back to internal loads. So I said yesterday that the subfunctions change at the endpoints at the places where there's point loads. And then the third one is the one you're asking about um, the points where the distributed load function changes.
Okay, so for example, um, if you have a distributed load like this, um, it's all following the same function from here to here, but then it stops, and so this point is is where the distributed load function changes. In this case, it turns off complete, you know, there's no distributed load to the right. But, whoops, you could also imagine it just switching from one function to another one. It's triangular, and then it's rectangular after that. You'd represent this, you know, the, the height of this distributed load is a line. So that's the function here. Well, it's one line here, and it's a horizontal line here. So you have to switch distributed load functions, and that means you have to make a cut. So, yep. Um, so doing the homework, I caught myself trying to add um, the right side to the, to the last cut. But then the oh, right. Process. Yeah, so can you explain really briefly like, why? Why you don't include that? Yeah, yeah well... Uh, so yesterday, it has to do with that thing yesterday where I drew, um, for each cut we did, I drew the three examples, like three different X values. And um, when I drew those three possibilities, um, none of them had X go all the way to the end. And if you don't make it to the end, then that force isn't applied. So... Um, uh, you... On these, we're never going to calculate internal loads at places where the subfunctions change, which means we're just never going to include endpoints. We're not going to do any calculations at endpoints or at places where point loads are applied. And overall force in that structure or in that body, whatever, like, could it be, I don't know, conceptually, could it be assumed that it's already kind of figured into, for example, the normal force on that one? Where yeah, that's right. I mean, it's, yeah, that's exactly right. It's, it's not like you're missing that information because if you know that the thing's in equilibrium, uh, then... Because that's what we first. Right. You do that first, and, and it's taken into account in calculating the external loads. Exactly. Yep. That's exactly how it comes in. I have the same question. Okay. So should I use the coordinator of the point force or coordinator of the vector? Of what? Point, should I use the... Oh, for determining when it changes? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, that's, a, that's a really good question that I'm going to try to bring out carefully when we do it. The answer is the points where we treat it as a point force, that's, that's a mathematical thing for us. That's not a real thing. The points, oh, yeah. the points for this are the real things, and that's where the distributed load changes. But it's a really easy mistake to make. Yeah. Um, so when we write the um, functions for like T of X and V of X, mm -hmm. um, if the functions are the same for two yeah. cuts, do we still have to write them separately because we're not calculating X? That we're yeah, that's a good question. Uh, no, I don't care. You can do it however you want. I like really. Um, I don't even end up usually writing it in that piecewise function. Uh, notation that I did yesterday. I was just trying to make it sort of explicit the first time, but um, as long as you like do your cuts, do those calculations, you can just leave those, box those equations as you go, and that's fine. But yeah, it doesn't make much sense to write something as a piecewise function if it's the same function in both. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, calculating internal loads when they're distributed loads. Um, and I'm going to... Uh, do the first example of this where the distributed load is the body's weight. So 
So let's say we're dealing with the weight of the beam. Um, up until now, uh, we've always just treated the weight as a point force acting at the center of mass. If, when you're calculating internal loads, you can't do that anymore. And so the first question is, why is it different now? Like it's been the same all through physics and all through this class up until now, and all of a sudden we have to treat weight differently. So, so what's the difference? Um, So why can't we just treat weight as a point force? Okay, so here's the example. Uh, let's say we have a cantilever beam on the right side. And let's say the beam is two meters long. And the mass of the beam is 100 kilograms. And we want to calculate P, V, and M. Okay, well, the first thing we have to do is um, calculate the external loads. Uh, in this case, and this, Javier, this is what you were asking a question about something related to this. Um, so we're going to go through this process, calculate the loads acting on the right side, right? And then when we do the cuts, whatever loads those are are never going to come into the problem. So if you ever have a problem like this where you have a cantilever on the right side, that's a chance to skip the steps of calculating the external loads because they're never going to come into the internal load calculation. So um, usually, not usually, always when I do problems like this, the reason I'm doing it that way is to save you some steps so you can spend your time on the other stuff that I want to test in that problem. So on the external loads on the right end don't affect the internal loads. Okay, so um, if we think of a free body diagram We have some force over here and some couple over here, and we don't care what those are. And then we have a distributed load representing the weight. Um, okay, so what's the total force applied by the weight in this problem? 981. Normally, we would treat it as acting at the center of mass, but now we're going to treat it as a distributed load. If the thing is two meters long, how many newtons per meter is the weight applying? 981 divided by two meters, right? So, uh, so you have a uniform distributed load that's equal to 981 newtons divided by two meters, so 490.5 newtons per meter. Uh, and where are the places in this problem where the sub-functions are going to change? Yeah, so just the endpoints. N is equal to 2. And that means we're just going to have one cut that represents the whole thing. Um, okay, so cut one. We're going to isolate a piece that goes from the left endpoint 
to x that's anywhere in this range between 0 and 2, non-inclusive of the endpoints. And if you draw a free body diagram of this cut, it looks something like this. Um, the part we're not isolating looks something like this. This stuff we don't care about. Um, this distributed load the whole way is 490.5. Okay, no, um, so this isn't saying, um, this is going to be a confusing thing for everybody over and over again, and then it won't be confusing, and then it will be again. So what we're saying is the piece that we're isolating goes all the way from the left end to some point x, and that point x can take any of these values. It, so th this isn't the interval that the beam that we're isolating isn't represented by that interval. Instead, this is all the possible options for where the right end goes. So we're solving for an equation for anything in between. Right. For, that's right. Yeah. So we're trying to find an equation that gives us T, V, and M no matter what X is as long as it's in this range. And the way I have it drawn is like X is equal to 0.8 or something. But the equations we're going to come up with are going to hold for x equals 1.2 and 1.8 and 0 0.1 and everything. And then kind of with that, I guess you can call it kind of like a ghost body up on the end. Yeah. Uh, do we have to draw that in? No. Okay. No, don't draw that in. I'm just trying to, um, I'm just trying to, visualize. yeah, help you visualize. Uh, okay, and then we have the internal loads, T, V, and M. Okay. So, why can't we treat the weight as a point force that acts at the center of mass? The way I have it drawn here, um, we haven't, so if x in my picture is equal to 0 0.8, in the part that we've isolated, the weight wouldn't even occur. It wouldn't even appear in the free body diagram because we haven't made it to the center of mass yet, you know. And so, all of this weight that we know should be acting on the isolated body would not appear in our picture. Okay? And then if, if I drew a picture that went past the center of mass, we would include all the weight, and it would be overcounting all the stuff that we were skipping, you know? And so, um, so once we start talking about internal loads, uh, you can't, you can't, um, treat the weight as a point force, and I'll, I'll give a try to give a um, clear definition, clear statement about when you can and when you can't. When we're done with this, all right. So this is our problem. We're trying to figure out T, V, and M for this, where the length of this is equal to x. Um, Just like when we were doing rigid bodies with distributed loads, we can't do these calculations without treating this distributed load as a point force. Okay, I said you can't take the whole weight and consider it a point force, but now that, now that we've chosen a body to isolate, we have to figure out a way to represent this distributed load as a point force. So think about this distributed load. Um, it has a height of 490.5. It has a length of x. Okay. So um, what's the area of that rectangle? Yep, 490.5x. And what's the centroid? x over 2. Yep. Yep. 
And so now we're going to treat this distributed load as a point force with a magnitude equal to 490.5x and acting at the location x over 2. So I'll redraw the free body diagram. We have a weight in the center with a magnitude of 490.5x. We have the internal loads. And so, okay, so think about this point force for a second. What this function is saying is if our x value is 0.1, then we have a weight that's equal to 490.5 times 0.1, so we have a very small amount of weight. If our x value is equal to 1.9, then we have almost all of the weight included in our free body. Okay, so it, it, that function adjusts the weight depending on how big x is. Uh, okay, so Newton's second law says 0, negative 490.5. Plus T zero plus Yes. That's what I was just talking about just two seconds ago. Okay, plus T zero plus zero negative V is equal to zeros. So T is zero and V is negative four ninety. 0.5x. Because v is negative, so you have to move it over. Stupid algebra. And then the moment equation. We're going to calculate it about the left end point. So what's the moment arm for 490.5x? X over 2. X over 2, yep. And the magnitude of the force is 490.5x. And is that a clockwise or counterclockwise moment? Clockwise, so negative. And then we have plus m minus vx is equal to 0. So M is equal to uh, 245.25 X squared plus VX. And that is 245.25 X squared. Uh, now plug in V for X minus 490.5x squared. And we can group those two and we get negative 245.25x squared. Yes, so I was going to go through all those checks. But instead of going through the second law, we just mm. Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good thought. Um, but you would need to know all the constants, all the constants of integration. And um, depending on how many cuts you have to make, there could be a lot of them. And uh, sometimes it can be tricky. So I think really this is a better way to do it, but you can do it that way, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, if um, this force is going that way, the about point is this way. So if, you're, if this thing was on ice with a hinge, you know, with a spike poked through the ice there, and you bumped it this way, it would rotate this way. I think I missed some of the Okay, so that's just going back to centroids. A centroid calculation. Um, if this is x equals 0, this is what we're calling x equals 0. So think of this as the origin. Uh, 
uh, we're just going to the middle of that rectangle. So the whole length of it is x, so the middle is x over 2. That's right. Yep. Okay, so let's do the five checks. Okay, the first one says, um, ooh, before I do that, so remember that Q I mentioned yesterday? Uh, no, you don't. Um, But that's one of the things that came up in that list of checks, and we hadn't talked about what it is yet. Um, that's the um, downward distributed load. Downward distributed load function. That's a function of x that gives the value of the downward distributed load at any point on the beam. OK, so. This is as simple as a distributed load can get. What's a function of x that gives you the, the height of this distributed load for any x value? It's just 490.5. It's just a constant function. If it was a parabola or a triangle or something, it would be dependent on x. But in this case, 490.5 is the function that represents that distributed load. Um, so in this example, Q is a constant function, so you can think of Q of X as being equal to positive 490.5. Why is it positive? Because it's the downward distributed load, and this is a downward, this distributed load is acting downward. Okay, so now the five checks. The first one says dm dx is equal to v. Okay, so look at the Look at the function for m. Take the derivative. That gives you the function v. So that one checks out. See that? Any questions about that one? OK, so that one's good. The second one says take the derivative of the shear, uh, the shear force function, that's equal to the negative value of q. Okay, so take the derivative of v with respect to x. You get negative 490.5. Then multiply that by negative 1, you get positive 490.5. And that's equal to q for this problem. Okay, so that one holds. And now we have those three sort of tedious ones at the end point. Um, the first one says at an end point, um, t is equal to 0 if and only if um, there is no horizontal point force at that end point. Okay, so on the left end of this beam 
Is there a horizontal point force acting? No. Uh, so we know that there should be um, a tension equal to zero when x is equal to zero. And actually, we got that the tension was equal to zero over the whole thing. So that one holds. We never figured out uh, what the external loads were that were applied by the wall. Um, I guess we would have to do that to use this check. But I, I think you can look at this and see that there wouldn't be any horizontal force produced by that. Yeah, that's what we got. Uh, Q is equal to 490.5. Okay, yep. How did you uh, find the derivative of X? Like, how do you know that's the negative one? Dx. Which one? For uh, numbers 1 and 2, mm -hmm. you said that Dx was equal to negative 1. For these two? Yeah. Well, I just went, so I just went to these functions. We have these three functions that are functions of x, m, v, and t. And the rule says that if you take the derivative of m with respect to x, you get the function v. So I just took the derivative of m, you know, so 2 times negative 245 x squared is, you know. So you're just taking derivatives of those polynomials. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then the fourth check says at an endpoint uh, v is equal to zero if and only if there's no vertical point force at that endpoint. Is there a vertical? Point force at the left end point. That's a little bit of a tricky one to answer. There is a vertical force. I mean, there's there's a vertical distributed load. But remember, um, a distributed load doesn't apply any finite force at a single point. Okay, you need to integrate it over some some distance to get a to get a finite force. So no, even though there's a distributed load at the left, there's no point force acting there. And so we still need to have zero shear force at the left end. And if you plug x equals zero into the function for v, you get that v is equal to zero at the left end point. And so that one holds at the left. And then what about at the right? Well, we don't know what the, is there a point force acting at the right? Well, there he is. We didn't calculate what it was. Um, yes, that's right. Yep. It, yeah, that's the only force that's keeping this from accelerating in translation downward is an upward force at the wall. And so there's a non-zero vertical point force applied by the wall. And so if we plug x equals 2 in for the shear force function, we need to get something that's not equal to zero. And if you look at that function for shear force, if you plug two into that function, you're going to get something non-zero. So that works. Any questions about that one? OK. And then the last one is for the bending moment. So it's the same idea. Uh, but this time we're talking about a um, point couple at that end point. Is there a point couple acting at the left end point? No. So if you plug in x equals 0 into the moment function, the bending moment function, you need to get 0. And you can see that x equals 0, evaluating this at x equals 0 gives you 0. And then at the right end point, we didn't calculate it because we were lazy and we skipped the, um, and I skipped that because I know how much you guys like being lazy. I could tell from the vector symbols. 
So, but if we had calculated those external loads, we would have seen that um, there would be a point couple here, non-zero. And so if you plug 2 in for x into the bending moment formula, you get a non-zero value, and that one checks out. It's going to give you, well, the, the whole thing is two meters long, so it would actually give you negative 981. But, oh, yeah. but yeah, it'll give you a, a negative number. Yeah, so then how is that going to counteract that force going? Well, it's because, remember, shear force is... You're th what you're thinking of is the external load at the wall, and that would be upwards. But shear force has that funny sign convention. So it doesn't matter if it's up or down. It's the same. I don't, I don't think of it that way. I mean, there's, uh, there's, I don't think there's any um, practical use for shear force where, where the direction really... Like, something's not more likely to break if shear force is positive or negative, that kind of thing. Yeah, I'm trying to understand how that counteracts. Okay, well, I think what you're thinking about for counter, the counteracting the weight force is the force applied to the beam by the wall. And that is upward. Um, but that's a little different than, uh, well... It's slightly different than the shear force. The shear force isn't saying what's the force the wall's applying to the object. It's saying what's the force that nearby material points are applying to nearby material points. And then not to mention that the shear force has that funny sign convention where positive is downwards. Any other questions? Yeah. For those checks, three, four, and five, are you just saying that at any point Only at the endpoints. At one of the endpoints and then the other one should be a number? Like Not necessarily. It just, you go end, so every beam has two endpoints. Mm -hmm. And so you can make those checks at each endpoint. Okay. Um, so if one doesn't work, you can look at the other one? They yeah. both have to work um, all the time. Or, or you did something wrong in your calculation. But so, weren't we just saying that, that the endpoint on the wall does have value? Yeah, but so that's what this... Um, this check says these values are equal to zero if and only if this stuff happens. Mm -hmm. So if this stuff doesn't happen, then it's going to be non-zero. Okay. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So um, for four and five, there, there was a vertical point force and there was a, a point couple. And that told us that the shear force and bending moment had to be non-zero. Mm -hmm. In those cases, if we got a value that was equal to zero our check would, would tell us something went wrong. Yeah. 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 Um, if the only external loads that... So the first step to doing these problems is calculating the external loads. So a lot of times this starts as a rigid body problem. Um, but if the only unknown external loads happen at the right end of the beam, all the way at the right end, you can skip it because they'll never come into the, they won't come into your cut calculation. They won't come into your calculation for internal loads. And that force that you're talking about is a point force versus a Right. Yep, because it's just a joint force that you're calculating. Yes, that's totally right. And there's a there's a couple of things, kinds of problems that we'll do where if you were sort of sneaky about it, you could get away with less work. But I would recommend that we just always do everything from the left because you basically you get twice as much practice. You know what I mean? Like um, if if you do it half the time from the left, half the time from the right, 
you're you're not as used to either one. Just do it the same way every time. If it's a little more work, that's fine. You know, you get paid by the hour. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's that's my recommendation. But you're exactly right. Yeah. Um, any other questions right now? All right. So let me uh, let me make one general comment. So. In general, this is a big thing. In general, this is always true. Um, when can you treat a distributed load like a point force? Because we had to do it in this problem, right? Well, you can do it even in. It doesn't even have to be rigid bodies. But here's the, um, so in general, when can you make the jump from a distributed load to its equivalent point load or point force? And the answer is, after you choose the body to isolate. OK, so let me uh, show you how that works in the problem we just did. So when we look at this, when we looked at this whole problem, we have this distributed load. Um, And we want, to, we want to treat it like a point force. But I'm showing you a free body diagram. That's a little confusing. But look at the first time that we used a free body diagram for a calculation, OK, here in cut one. The way this worked was we represented this as a distributed load, chose the body to isolate. We chose a chunk of the body that had a length of x. And once we chose that we were going to isolate x meters of this body in this way, then we could take the amount of the distributed load acting on it and represent it as a point force. OK? What we can't do is look at the whole thing, say that the total distributed load is acting at the center of mass, and then after that, choose a piece of this body to isolate that might or might not include that point force. OK? So I'll try to keep mentioning that point, but that's, that's the idea. That's why. And so why, in every problem we've done up, to, up until now, have we been able to treat weights, distributed load as, loads as point forces? Um, that's because we never we never made distinctions about what part of the body we were isolating. We were always isolating the whole body. So we always included its whole weight. Um, OK, that's it. Uh, let's take a 10-minute break. Um, I'll start at 2.20. OK. So um, that's probably the most complicated this can get, you would think, right? It's got to be. <laughs> Not really. Okay, so uh, let's let's go. Excuse me. Uh, one step more complicated. So let's say we have a beam with a pin joint at one end and a roller at the midpoint and a triangular distributed load. Actually, I have had, I have had to call plumbers and be like, <laughs> like on something where like I've obviously like screwed all this stuff up. It's very embarrassing. Like you're just like they just look and sort of like yeah, and you're like yeah. 
I don't want to go through that again. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, I, what was I doing? It was it was something with a toilet in the basement. I was like, I was like replacing a toilet or something. But then, like, I couldn't. I don't know. I, like, I got pretty far into it, and then was just like, I don't know what's. I don't know how to do this next step, you know. And it was like, because YouTube gives you a false sense of security, you know? Because, like, there's a video on how to do everything, but then always some little, it might be little, it might be big, something happens that doesn't happen on the video. And you're like, uh, what's this little gasket here? That's not on the video, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> All right, so let's do this. So now we have a, distributed load that um, that varies with X. That's the difference. It's not uniform anymore. Yep. So, would an example of that be like a 10,000 Newton weight that's going to shape the triangle? Yes. Uh, you know, um, the, the simplest example that would give you this is like a pile of sand in that shape. But that that's not very likely to happen. But um, if you have distributed loads can come up a bunch of ways. And um, there could be, this could be some kind of dynamic force. There's a weight on top of it that some kind of dynamic motion is making this, is making it occur in this way. Um, you could have a triangular distributed load that's on the inside of like a, a round bearing or something because of the, that's just the load that's being applied by the thing spinning in the bearing or whatever. So um, what would be causing this exactly? It's, it's hard to come up with a real good example, you know, but I think the idea is more that this is a tool that can be useful in specific cases later, you know. Um, but yeah, I suppose if you had like a wedge-shaped mass, um, this would possibly be a good approximation of the distributed load that it would apply. Um, okay, so first, uh, let's take this as the, as the coordinate system. What's the Q function for this? We're trying to calculate the distributed loads. Um, okay, so what's Q of X? So Q, remember, is the function that you plug in an X value and it gives you the magnitude of the distributed load at that point. So this function needs to be zero when X is equal to zero. And it needs to be 10,000 when X is equal to two. So yeah, um, you can think of it as like, um, it's a linear function. The Y intercept is zero. The slope is the rise over run, so 10,000 over 2. So this is equal to 5,000x. And so when we get our function that represents the shear force, um, and we take the derivative with respect to x, it needs to give us negative 5,000x. OK, that's one of those checks. All right, well, this one. We can't get away without calculating distributed load, uh, without calculating um, reaction loads, because one of the reactions happens right in the middle. So we got to calculate it this time. So first, the external loads.
and um, I'm isolating the whole body. We have like, I'll call this RB, that's a force vector. And then we have a force with a known direction, this normal force RA. And now that we've chosen the body to isolate, we can represent this distributed load as a point force. Um, so if the height is 10,000 and the width is 2, the area is equal to 10,000 times 2 over 2, so 10,000. And the centroid is 2 thirds of the way, you know, um, two thirds of the way from the origin to the to the wall side of the triangle. So two thirds of two is four thirds. And that's meters. And so uh, we have a point force of 10,000 newtons acting with this moment arm that's equal to four thirds. So Newton's second law says zero RA plus zero negative 10,000 plus RBX RBY is equal to zeros. And the moment equation, uh, let's, so once we get into the internal loads calculations, we're always going to choose the about point at the left. But for the external loads, we can still do that the same way that we always have. So I'm going to choose it over at B this time. That means uh, there's no moment produced by RB. Uh, there is a moment produced by the 10,000. And what's the moment arm? Two thirds. One third of the way from the right, but, but the whole thing is two meters long. So it's, yeah, so two thirds times 10,000, and then about, well, actually, usually these downward forces are negative, because usually we have our about point here, but now our about point's here, so this force would make it rotate that way, and so it's positive. To figure out where to apply that distributed load as a point force. These forces would all be, this 10,000 Newton force, if you moved it around, it would give totally different answers for these reaction forces. Yeah. Yeah. It depends what your about point is. And and I chose I chose an about point different than I usually do on this. I put it where there's where there are the most unknown forces. So uh, and then um, what's the moment arm for R A? Okay, so yeah, moment arm of one times RA, and would that be a clockwise or counterclockwise rotation? Clockwise, and then that's all. So all of this gives us RA is equal to 6666.7, six, 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 six repeating. And RB is equal to zero, and then three, 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 three point three repeating.
Okay, so now we can go to the cuts. Um, and if you do your cuts based on this free body diagram we just did to calculate the external loads, you're in severe danger of making a mistake. Because um, who just asked me this earlier? Someone here just asked me this earlier. Benan, maybe. Uh, so when you're dealing with a distributed load, what's the important point for determining where one subfunction ends and where the next subfunction ends? It doesn't have anything to do with the point where that distributed load acts. That's a fake thing. That's a mathematical thing that's for our use. What really matters is just where the function changes. And so um, our subfunctions are going to change at the left end, the right end, and then where there's a point force at the roller and nowhere else. Okay? This thing. That's not a real thing. So that's an easy mistake to make. Okay, so n equals 3. That says that we're going to have to do two cuts. The first cut, um, we're going to isolate a piece that goes from the left end to some x value. And that x value can take uh, can be anything between zero and one. And a free body diagram. I'm going to go back to doing this ghost load thing. Um, Okay, so there's the triangular distributed load. Um, there's a point force over here. There's a reaction load there. But the part of the distributed load that matters for this problem, for this part of the problem, is only the part that's acting on our isolated piece. All the distributed load in blue is, we don't want that in the, in the calculation. Um, so, and then we have the internal loads. And the sort of tricky thing is we know that this distance is x, but we don't know what the height is anymore. We know the height over here is 10,000, but the value of this distributed load at the right end of our isolated piece, that depends on what x is. So how are we going to represent this as a function of x? That's the, that's the Q that we calculated. So this is equal to Q. And what was it equal? Positive 5,000x. And now we want to treat this relevant part of the distributed load as a point force so that we can do our calculations. Um, so let's isolate that one piece of triangle. Um, it has a width of x. It has a height of 5,000x. So what's the area, the total force? 2,500x squared. 2, squared, yep. And what's the centroid? Uh, yep, that's a two thirds x. Yep, so two x over three because it's two thirds of the way from the point to the wall. So now I'll redraw this free body diagram.
We have the internal loads. We have the point force representing the distributed load, where this is 2,500 x squared. This distance is 2x over 3. And now we have everything we do need uh, to calculate Newton's laws. So Newton's second law says 0, negative 2,500 x squared plus T0 plus 0, negative V is equal to zeros. So T is 0 and V is negative 2,500 x squared. And now the moment equation. Um, and for internal loads, we always calculate the moment around the left. So that's what I'm going to do here. Uh, the moment arm for this 2,500 x squared force is 2x over 3. So we have 2x over 3 times 2,500 x squared. And is that clockwise or counterclockwise? Clockwise. Because we moved our about point again. If I could definitely understand an argument for just never moving that about point, you know, just always keeping it there because it, it'll just make it less likely to make dumb mistakes. Okay, so we have this. Uh, then we have plus m. Uh, you have to think about what it's rotating around. So what we choose as the about point is what it's rotating around. So imagine this being like a hinge, and you, you tap it this way, it rotates that way around that point. Oh. That's why when, when I just chose the about point over here, the downward force made it rotate the other way. Okay. okay. Yep. <clears throat> You're just totally fixated on working from the other direction. Yes. Uh, yes. It would still, it would still work its way in, but it would be more complicated. So yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't change the answers, but the algebra just gets a little messier to get there. That's all. Um. Okay, so we have this one. We have m minus vx is equal to 0. So m is equal to, uh, I believe that is 1, 6, 6, 6, and 6 repeating x to the third plus vx. And Vx is negative 2,500x cubed. So we end up with minus 833.3 3 repeating x cubed. And we can check this right now. Uh, you know, 3 times 830, negative 833 is negative 2,500. So that works. And then we can also check um, if we take the derivative of v with respect to x, we need to get negative q. So dv dx is negative 5,000x. That's equal to negative q. So that one works too. Okay, so now we have the second cut. So we're going to isolate a piece that goes all the way from the left end to an x value that varies. Um, so now this x represents the right side. And now the right side can be anywhere between 1 and 2. But remember, we're still isolating a piece that's left end is, is the full left end. You know. Um, so a lot of times, 
people get confused because I have this interval that says one to two, but I'm still including things happening with, yeah, right. But that's because this interval represents the right side. We're always including everything starting at the extreme left side. Right, that's right. Yep, we're just adding chunks onto the part that we're isolating, yep. But we're doing it so that our um, pointwise function represents, you know, to get the next pieces in the piecewise function. Uh, okay, so now we have this force. What was the value of that? Who knows? Sixes. And then we have the internal loads. And then we have the triangular distributed load. Um, this distance is x, this height is q, which is still 5,000 x. And so we get the same stuff for that triangle. We still have a triangle with a, a width of x and a height of 5,000 x. It's just that the x values represent a different range now. So the area is 2,500x squared. The centroid is 2x over 3. And now we can draw this free body diagram with the distributed load as a point force. So we have 6, 6, 6, 6. 0.6 repeating. And we have the distributed load that has a value of 2,500x squared. And this distance from the left endpoint is 2x over 3. And then we have the internal loads. Okay, so Newton's second law says 0, negative 2,500x squared plus 0, 6, 6, 6, 6.6 repeating plus, I'm going to lump the t and the v vectors together. They always appear the same. I'm just going to write it as t negative v. That's just what you get if you add those two vectors together. And that's equal to 0. So t is equal to 0. And v is equal to negative 2,500x squared plus 6666.6 repeating. And then the moment equation about the left endpoint the 2500 x squared force has a moment arm of 2x over 3 and is that positive or negative negative uh, the 66 66666 uh, what's the moment arm for that one? One. one. Yep. That doesn't, no matter what x is, that's still at the same location, just one from the endpoint. And that one's positive. Right. Yep, that's what we calculated when we did the external loads. And then we have plus m. Minus Vx is equal to 0. So M is equal to uh, negative 6666.6 6, 6, 6, 6. 6 repeating plus uh, 
1666.6 repeating x cubed plus vx and if you plug in the value of v here you get negative 6666.6 repeating plus 6666.6 repeating times x uh, minus 833.3 repeating times x cubed. Um, we already did the derivative checks on the first piece. On the second piece, if you take the derivative of m with respect to x, you get v. If you take the derivative of v with respect to x, you get negative q. So those both check out, and then the endpoints are time consuming and we're out of time, but you could do those too. Any questions about that? Yeah. Um, well, we're not going to do anything more complicated than triangular distributed loads. So, the, so Q is always going to be a linear function. Um, and so all you have to do is... Um, so V is always zero, and I point to again. Well, when the triangle is pointed this way, B is always zero. We're going to do... The next example we do will be one where B is not equal to zero. Okay. But you just have to use the function uh, mx plus b. Yep. 